Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar with Plutora. Today we're going to be talking about Don't Break It, Managing Risk and Complexity While Organising Around Valley Streams. My name is Helen Beale and today I am with Jeff Cade and Soren Pedersen. Uh, I'm a Waves Working Coach and I'm Chief Ambassador at the DevOps Institute. Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> you bet. I I've been with Plutora for a couple of years. I, by background, was a developer, architect, uh, turned to a product guy, marketing guy, and, and now I run the product organization here at Plutora with a lot of ties into the marketing side. Thank you, Jeff. Soren, please tell everyone who you are. Yeah, sure. So my name is Soren Peterson, and I'm the co-founder of Building Better Software. Uh, I've been in the IT business on and off for 10 to 15 years, mainly in high-tech companies, large corporations, uh, working with value streams and, and setups in that area. Uh, and now we do isolated consultation for, for larger corporations to help them transition through the same phase as we did. Fantastic. So today we're going to be talking about organizational design um, around valley streams. We have a bit of a flow. We are a panel today. We are we do have some slides that we're sharing with you, but it's mainly about the conversation we're going to be having uh, with each other and also hopefully with yourself. So we are on GoToWebinar today. There is a questions panel on your control panel. So feel free, audience, to put any questions in that panel at any time. I will be keeping my eye out and we can, uh, between Jeff, Soren and I, we can talk about uh, what you want to know about. So broadly, the flow, we're going to be talking about traditional organisational design and then we'll talk about flattening the pyramid and then talk about what value stream led organisational design means and how that relates to cellular organisational design. So let's start by thinking about the typical pyramid that most organizations currently are designed around. So mm -hmm. Soren, let's start with the question, what is the problem with the lots of layers that we see in this pyramid in an organization? And this pyramid only shows five, but um, there are examples I'm sure you have worked with or for organizations with more than five layers, but what is the problem with the layers in an organization? Yeah, so what we tend to experience and, and I've had in my whole working life is that you have a large group at the bottom who needs to make day-to-day -day operations work and make swift decisions on, on questions. But when you have large organizations, you typically see uh, decisions need to go up the value chain and it becomes uh, a slightly longer process and it becomes a bit inefficient. And worst case, it becomes political. So decisions are really hard to reach and you're having a hard time creating an agile and efficient organization below unless you go a bit out of the ordinary way i'd say mm -hmm. how do you go out of the ordinary way yeah well typically you do something uh, where you install a piece of software or you make a decision that is perhaps not entirely agreed upon in the organization but to move the organization forward anyway uh, especially where you have development departments that are out of alignment with it departments and and so on large corporations often referred to as shadow IT as well mm -hmm. or or you end up with other problems where the organization has decided certain standard parameters the classic one is you know you're in a big bank security is critically important uh, there's a team working on a non-important uh, you know informational kind of web aspect and yet they're facing the same scrutiny investment for making sure that they don't blow anything up for something that they don't need to do that. There's, there's a lot of stuff that ends up lost in translation in this kind of model where uh, you know, regional or local decision-making becomes really hard because it's all being driven from the top. Let's talk about the top for a minute. What is that orange triangle? Who is that? And what are the layers below it typically? Go ahead, Soren. So typically you would see some sort of C-level uh, or executive vice presidents at the top who are governing a quite large area uh, in companies. And then you'll have a, a layer or two of directors, middle layer managers that have to enforce the policies and the direction from leadership from above. And they become like a, a layer of insulation, you could say. So problems have an, an issue surfacing at the top and still the top needs to make strategic decisions and communicate that through their middle layer managers and their translations of what's being said. So that's kind of the classic way to do stuff and, and what we see out there. Mm -hmm. 
And the larger because the corporation, the more layers, the more complicated it gets, actually. Yeah, you can see there's quite a lot of distance there. And I think we've perhaps been generous with just the five layers here. I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think British Telecom in the UK at one point had well over 20 layers. And they took a load of layers out and were really proud of themselves. And they still had like 15 layers. <laughs> you can see that kind of Chinese whispers, like someone has an idea at the top and by the time it gets to the bottom, is it is it the same as what started at the top? Exactly. So and, and you'd see, sorry, uh, um, you'd, see, uh, you'd see people discuss the same message in different ways because perceptions are, are widely different depending on your context and what you're doing. So that actually generates a lot of, of intercommunication that is challenging and, and wasting your time. Yeah, so let's move on to the, the next diagram, which kind of delves into those layers that you just described in a little bit more detail. So here we've got uh, the technology teams. So we've got our CIO at the top. Um, and then what you were just saying, sorry, about how the context changes depending on, on where you are. So I think what we're seeing here is silos. So <clears throat> do silos create layers or do layers create silos in your mind? Sorry, once more. The silos, is it is it the silos that have made us have layers or is it the layers that have made us create silos? Yeah, I, I think it's either or. I mean, it, it comes from the structure you have here from top down and that creates your silos because people are fenced in, you could say, all, all communication inside the development department only goes to that piece of the organization and this he or she is explicitly visiting other parts of the organization. And again, it's a translation of what's being said. So we, if head of IT operations is very security focused, that'll be his core emphasis, but the head of development really needs to get product out and that will be the core of his or her communication, right? And that creates the silos. I, you know, it. I, I was gonna add to that, even from the management perspective of the different layers and what you see, how do you manage development? How do you manage um, a support desk? They're given certain metrics of delivery. So you can say, yeah, they're doing good. Is that really the right metric for the overall flow or process? How many tickets do they complete an hour? Or if you were to measure development on the number of story points that they're pushing through, is that really the right measurement to, to measure their success on? By definition, just by having them in this kind of organization and the way that they get managed creates these layers and silos because people are gonna optimize for where the money's coming from and how they're being perceived in the organization. So as soon as you have these kinds of layers and divvy people out and say, I'm gonna manage them by this organization, um, there's fundamental differences of goals. Where did dev and ops get their conflict from? Ops, you better make sure stuff stays up live, make sure nothing blows up, dev, push as much crap out as you can, as quickly as you can, and we're gonna optimize these two. The whole definition of where DevOps came from was let's join the goals of these two teams so that we have a, a, a shared definition of what success looks like. Well, gosh, we've been doing this for years, and so this kind of culture has been integrated and, and combined into large organizations, especially because you still need a way to manage, but you gotta find a better way of doing it. This traditional model has, um inherent problems and that's the problem that's what we're dealing with now let's talk about where it came from though right so <clears throat> i've worked with some really old organizations like 250 years old that have existed before this sort of information technology ever existed so quite understandably the kind of their um, there came a point where i don't know they bought a mainframe or whatever the predecessor of that was and then they hired some people to manage it and more people and there became a point where they had these people that were effectively running something that was a back office function very much a kind of administration function um, but they hired more and more people and as they hired more people they needed some kind of structure in order to understand what work was being done and to direct that work so they saw it as a cost center so they started creating silos by subject matter expertise which seemed like an obvious way to manage that cost center and i think that all worked pretty well for quite a while until the internet arrived and digital transformation started and we were suddenly under pressure to create more things and also the importance of our digital services 
to our customers became such that we then looked at this model that we've created to manage our cost centers to discover that what we've created was a model where we had lots of handoffs and there were lots of delays and it was difficult to, as we've said, communicate vision and articulate uh, clarity around goals from the top down all these layers through um, what can often be multiple management layers in some organisations and get um, that direction to uh, the people at the bottom. And this is one of my fundamental problems with the traditional organisational pyramid is you kind of got this idea of these people at the bottom almost like they're the people of least worth and they often are the least well paid in our industry because that's the, how we've designed these bureaucratic models that the higher you get up the pyramid the more money you get paid but in reality the people that are doing the day-to-day -day work are those ones at the bottom but if we look to Taylorism and the way that his which is where a lot of this comes from he kind of said that these people are kind of stupid and they don't know what they're doing and they need to be told what to do and they need to be prescribed what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Whereas if you look at that bottom row, business analysts, full stack engineers, cloud architects, cloud engineers, security engineers, support engineers, none of those people sound like they're going to be stupid. So why are we treating them like they're stupid? Mm -hmm. That's that's true. And to to give kind of a real life perspective on it, uh, in one of the companies I work, we uh, had an IT department enforcing a lot of security requirements. So our compilers and stuff take upwards four times the the time required to compile and deliver software. But as head of development and having a not me but but the head of development and the CEO having a talk, they figured out we could actually remove these uh, obstacles to the development pace and and speed up development. And, but again, it's it's a matter where it has to go entirely to the top because the guys at the bottom are well aware of what goes on and, and technically should be able to make an agreement, but they're not allowed due to company policies and so on, due to this old way of structuring things. But uh, yeah. huge gains are to be found out there if you restructure towards a more skill-based focused direction as we're talking about here into value streams. Yeah, it reminds me of when, you know, when I first started my career as a programmer, one of the best pieces of advice I got way back then was, look, don't go to work for a big IT organization, a really big company. You'll get siloed, you'll be in some kind of box, and you definitely won't work with the best technology. You'll you'll work with old antiquated stuff. And the majority of my career has been with small startups and, and um, seeing that life where you can't exist with heavy layers and lots of silos, it just doesn't work. You you can't be agile enough. And now that the world has changed, where every enterprise is realizing they're a software company, they have to deliver software faster in order to keep up, um, where software has actually become the product of big enterprise, the world's changed. And I think it's impacting the organizations as well um, uh, to put pressure on these legacy models, because that's what we should call them as legacy. We've got a, a question from the audience or a comment from the audience, which I think is going to lead us into our, our next section, which is kind of a, what we're talking about from a culture perspective. But the, the observation is that we've put business analysts under engineers in this hierarchical model, which is, uh, you know, an interesting one. I think what we were trying to say there is this is what kind of the development part. We only had a limited number of boxes to put on there. But let's talk about the relationship between this traditional IT organisational chart and the next one. Uh, which is a traditional um, business chart. Jeff, thank you, perfect, thank you. Um, so we haven't got business analysts on here, but they could. we could put them on here. But there's a whole conversation about um, IT and the business. And I'm sure everyone that's on the call has worked in organisations where those, those sort of terms are banded about like they are completely different entities, which is another symptom of this siloization. So not only do we get silos in technology between dev and ops and then even more granular between um, teams and departments within those departments, but across an organization we have uh, silos. Um, so culturally, what does that mean? What does a culture look like when we have created these silos within technology and across the whole business? Soren, what have you seen in, in real life? What, what does it feel like to work in an organization where we have these barriers between people? Yeah, so as 
mostly coming from the the product development side, uh, doing software and, and embedded software and so on. It has been a lot of frustration because uh, you feel you're fully qualified to make decisions. You understand uh, many of the technologies very well, but you're consistently met with uh, a resistance that is either intangible or tangible, where you're being told you can't do so and so, and you can't really work efficiently. A bit like Jeff said, you're going to be boxed in in a silo and, and you work with the old technologies, not uh, so much on the old technologies on my part. And it requires a lot of communication and, and dialogue with the guy sitting on your other side to actually make this flow uh, in, in reality. And in my view, that is uh, a sad waste of energy and time on everybody's behalf where we could actually create more value for our customers. But again, you also have to respect what they're trying to safeguard and, and what they're putting in the world to do to have a stable operating business so your warehouses don't go down or, or whatever that might be they're trying to protect, right? So one one of the solutions is a bit more sandbox-wise or, or similar ways to get around this stuff. So that tension between change and stability that we see in, within Dev and Ops can happen across the whole business. I think um, Jeff and I talk about this a lot in the context of the highly regulated industries and this, mm -hmm. this wanting to remain governed whilst being allowed to deliver value at speed, Jeff. Uh, no, that's exactly right. I mean, I, back to the you know fintech world it, in in cases if if you're not compliant like there's you know criminal kind of stuff at play so you know how to stay out of orange jump shoot suits means uh someone from the executive side feels like they must push these things down otherwise it won't happen and it lacks this uh, uh it, it 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 you know curbs the ability for individual teams to um, explore the creativity, you know, creative ways of, of how to uh, still stay compliant and, and address these kinds of problems, you know, or there's a fear that there'll be some security opened up and, or there's a fear that we'll develop something that's not the right thing. And um, it, it really, the fundamental point to it is that um, really these teams aren't trusted. And without trust, you know, uh, you know, we must enforce by other means, and we must enforce by layers of management and so forth. And it's completely counterintuitive and counter the approach of of where to go. Uh, you, you know, organizationally, do you believe that there's going to be one domineering area that's going to be smart enough to tell everybody in every circumstance exactly what they need to do, or do you enable lots of uh, of self-enabled teams that are self-learning, that are uh, abiding by the guidelines in their own model. That's your fundamental question you got to figure out when it comes to team organization. But it's really hard to change because in the rest of, uh, you know, management science would say exactly what we talked about in the beginning. The pyramid is the model. That's how you do it. You just enforce it all and and go back to the worker bees. I hate that term. Um, and And, you know, they'll just do whatever you tell them. No, but, yeah. <laughs> but. <laughs> but is the pyramid the model? And Soren used the word reality <clears throat> as well. So, and I think Spotify said it. They said any organizational chart is just an illusion. So, if we look at the the next um, diagram, it's kind of like what is the reality? Does the reality some, look something more like this? It's just like random net, networks of people with sort of you know, this kind of self-belief, this almost like legal fiction in their head about what their role is and where they sit in the organization. It's more like a random load of humans running about, but that sounds totally chaotic, right? So there must be something better to aim at and we're starting to touch on that. So let's look at what we're trying to transition from and to. We know we're trying to transition uh, in a world that has pressures. Um, can we get the next slide? If we're moving from um, the pressures of um, the uh, digital transformation, so the uh, preponderance of internet-based services, um, we know there is a different model, right? So we've looked, I've mentioned Spotify, a lot of people look to that model. Um, there's also other new models emerging. Uh, Reinventing Organisations was probably published at least six years ago now, mm -hmm. I think, and it uh, talks a lot about holacracy. Um, Soren and I actually years ago did a talk at the first DevOps Enterprise Summit in London, which was called Correlations Between DevOps and Holacracy. And a lot of the material uh, we were working with was from this book by Frederick Laloux. Um, 
More recently, we've had uh, Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pace uh, publish Team Topologies uh, earlier on this year, and very recently, in the past few weeks, we've had Humanocracy from Gary Hamill and Michaela Zanini, um, which all give us guidance on how to break these silos and how to create organisational models that are more fluid and more efficient in terms of the way uh, they treat the humans and the people within them. So, if we go to the next slide, in the same way that most people recognise in the world, particularly in the technical world, we are transitioning from one place to another and broadly <clears throat> in technology we are transitioning from waterfall to agile or project to product, however you want to describe it. We are also transitioning in terms of organisational design from a place where we have the hierarchical models that we have been looking at to a place where teams have more autonomy. So, Soren, how do we go about creating cross-functional teams if they are a foundational component of autonomy? That is the million-dollar question, I'd say. But <laughs> let, let's talk cool. about it. Uh, so, what what I've typically been part of and seen is that uh, somewhere you start the initiative, and that team. Uh, grows into something that is self-sustained within a boundary, right? So you can kind of carve out a small piece and start building that up. Sometimes you need to to move across the value stream or the value chain, you'd say, and pull in people from other parts of the organization, but but you have to start small. And as you start growing that part, you, you build an example where you can show that if you bring the right people into the right context and enable them to do what they need to do to deliver value to the customers, they, they're getting uh, to that point. The difficult part is, and, and that's also in the title of this uh, side deck, there's a lot of complexity, right? You can't just pull people out of the context and say, now you're in this team and all you did before has to be handled by your colleagues and, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, handling the risk and, and making sure you don't drop the ball on a lot of stuff in an organization. When you start changing from a very focused on a task thingy organization, the hierarchy, into a value stream where you actually handle the entire product end to end. Uh, and, and that's what I've been part of doing and, and how we've moved along. Often it's, it starts in an IT team for some odd reason, because they, they're the ones that are most frustrated or developing team, I'd say. And then you tend to pull in the rest of, of the organization slowly as you push out the idea and, and bring on people. That's at least the starting point. Yeah, and Jeff, who, who's in a, a multifunctional team? What kind of skills are in that that team? And do we call it a feature team, a product team, a platform team, a service team, a value stream team? What What is that team? <laughs> um, it, yes, <laughs> I've, I've seen a number of those terms used. Um, and, and following on that, depending upon the organization, it feels... It, how do we go back in a in a DevOps transformation? We go through this mental model of saying, how do I take this monolithic application and and um, compose it as a you know decompose it, if you will, into smaller bits, chunks. Whether I'm going to microservices, service virtualization, how do I draw different boundaries? In the same fashion, um, I, I think the the process of getting there is is starting with believing of what the end goal is. Ultimately, we want small independent teams that are are cross-functional and they're they're complete value streams whether they rent some resources from a, a, a shared services or a center of excellence or they um, have those uh, resources full time that's our goal and believing um, in that is step one I think step two then is taking the next step of wherever you are and and starting that decomposition when I was at Microsoft um, we actually had a Pretty cool set of, and this is like 2000, um, 2002. We we were at that point business units that reported in um, completely autonomous, and we had a, a goal, and 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 corporate felt like it it was a, a venture capitalist. We had a, a financial goal to hit, but we had a, a company size uh, of about 100, and either we hit our goal or we didn't. Um, visiting Amazon was amazing. I live here in the Seattle area, and and to think about an individual page because Amazon's done very well at cross-functional teams and, and having autonomous teams and, and seeing what's going on in there. Uh, to think about an individual page being made up of you know, 40, 50 different teams promoting their components there, it's real, it works. 
um, getting there is, is this is the journey that we're on. And it's not just a technology journey. It's an organizational one. It's a culture one to be able to trust that, um, you know, we can get there. So here's a question for you, Ben. Where does the value stream start? Where does it end? And what roles are involved? Well, I, I think of value streams going all the way back from idea all the way into production. And the only way to make that be successful is to think of value being delivered from the customer's perspective. So if that's the case, you got to look back of where the ideas get created. Where's my funding starting from? Who actually creates the requirements? Who defines what is success? Who defines the quality that's needed? How it will implement? Who defines the process and the technology? Who defines the operational? Uh, the more we move to the model of you designed it, you built it, you own it, you support it, you get the call in the middle of the night. That's what it's all about. Getting so that we're completely autonomous teams and, and cross-functional from that uh, perspective. Now, will a uh, you know sysadmin that owns a particular piece, uh, maybe that's the network infrastructure, do we need that guy full-time? Probably not but certainly having them involved in the team. So we're renting a portion of that. What about the uh, uh, security guy? Probably not. You know, We can rent some of that too and, and bring that into our cross-functional team. I want to mix a couple of things up that you said there. One is you said about you design it, you build it, you do that. I want to change that to we built it, we own it. So exactly. that you thing, again, it's being done to people. What we want to stop is that. We want people to own it. And then the thing you just said about renting parts of people, one of the things I think we're aiming for is to have cross-skilled multifunction, cross-skilled teams, but also cross-skilled people, some multifunctional people. So exactly. I want to refer back to Soren and some of the work that he did in previous roles that we talked about during the correlations of DevOps and Holacracy talk about um, the fact that Holacracy doesn't like job titles and it doesn't like job titles because it puts people into buckets. So Soren, talk to us about your experiences about creating teams of multifunctional people. Yeah, so to build on, on Jeff's comment about pulling it all the way back to the, the customer and that starting point, that has been key. Uh, when when we've had a, I'd say a good product owner, a good customer representative, we have seen a team where, where people become extremely motivated to deliver results and they, they really pick up the ball across the line. Uh, and secondly, there's a lot of discussion about who should you have in a team and, and how to do you resolve uh, uh, having one of each, which is really not practical in reality. Again, uh, there we've seen a lot of teams adopt roles and hats, and people might have a preference for, for doing sorts of things that are outside the professional trade, but they need to learn and, and build up their capability in the team if they're motivated and inspired. Uh, but, but that's probably one of the main ways uh, we've seen it. And then Typically, we see a lot of uh, roles and, and hierarchies being removed in organizations because responsibility is segmented way too much and put into two structures where you need to ask people for admission and so on. Mm -hmm. And those to flatten out and say, okay, now you as a team need to make these decisions and you need to step in uh, and understand and, and own this problem rather than having somebody outside the team saying you have to do this and this and this so that could be a, a type of architect role or, or whatever in the organization but the transition again and the culture is is a very big thing because now people they were used to having somebody to go to and, and get these kind of answers now they have to sit down and reflect and actually make up their own mind and, mm -hmm. and take it and that can also be a, a bit of a rough ride until people get into that mode and start owning their domain I, well, in fact, I think there's an appreciation that happens for, you know, any coaching or help. Think of the first time, you know, at the developer in me kind of calls that. I, I think of the first time I had to really, you know, it's like, okay, Jeff, you own this piece of UI. And it was like, great, I can go build it, but it just looked wonky. And I'll tell you the amount of appreciation I got as I brought in other people to like, you know, show me, well, why don't you like move stuff around, style it like this? And, and by the time you got done, it was cool. But there was a collaboration that happens there in that cross-functional manner. And that happens across the board, whether it's, you know, again, UI, security, operationally, and so forth. But I like that, Helen, completely agree. We built it, we run it, we own it. 
Let's take a look at the, the next slide, because <clears throat> we're touching on this now in the conversation that we're having. And I know it's kind of popular to discredit Spotify <laughs> a little bit these days, but um, I think they still produce some very wise words in their time and some models that we can do. And they are doubtlessly a very successful company. Um, I really like this um, chart and anybody that's seen um, the videos would have seen that this starts out as a straight line um, where we kind of think that these things are, are always opposite or in tension with each other and then they, what they do is they draw it more like a chart um, with this realisation that actually we can balance alignment and autonomy. So we're touching on this already, you know, I think you guys are talking about how we move from one place to the other. You're talking about how scary it can be for somebody that's not had any autonomy to suddenly be told that they've got autonomy. So let's just go back and try and recap on it. Soren, how do we balance the alignment with autonomy? What are the practical activities that can happen, um, particularly led by leaders, when we're trying to move our teams to a place where they're more autonomous? Yeah, so what what I've typically, typically experienced is that people need to be told repetitively that they are autonomous, you'd say, or they are in, in, in charge now. Because as Jeff said, coming from a, a long streak of being controlled and directed in what to do, they have to regain their footing and, and understand they're actually making these decisions. Then as a leader, you need to, if, if you're isolated in your organization, you need to help your team in the surrounding organization to go and explain okay so we're going down the street we're trying to do this kind of thing in, in our part of the organization i need you guys to back up and and support and then you of course need to enable these guys right help them get the right flows to the right uh, decision points the right process for for working as an autonomous team where you suddenly have to self-organize you have to manage your own time you have to figure out what we're going to do tomorrow what we're going to do in 14 days and and so on although led by a product roadmap and for a programmer, having been in the same position for quite a while, that is a huge transition. People mm -hmm. actually get really scared and they, they get quite frustrated. And that's where the agile coaching and, and the help comes in, where you need somebody who can guide them and, and take those discussions and, and help them out. And I can't count on, on my fingers how many times I've had a discussion with a developer, but, but you know, you have to own it now. This is the change we're trying to make. You're, you're really responsible for this part or this piece of, of the product moving forward. And that's that's a long dialogue. It takes a while. Mm -hmm. It takes a while. There's a great talk. I think it's Jenny Brown. It's Jenny somebody from Royal Bank of Scotland that she did a couple of years ago at DevOps Enterprise Summit um, in London. And she's a, a leader and she talked about the leadership model that they have at RBS and then how they started to tell people that they had autonomy. And, um, and they kind of left them to it. And then after a few months, someone came up and said, when are you going to tell us what to do? And she said, well, we'd wait for you to tell us what you want to do. And they kind of went off and, and they got really frustrated until in the end, they came back and said, right, since you're not going to tell us what to do, we're going to tell you what we want to do. But it took like six months of just like a standoff before the people broke. But it's, we laugh, but it's not really fair because these people, it's like years and years of being told to get back in your box, do as you're told. That's the behavior that we've been taught, isn't it? So to suddenly tell somebody they've got autonomy, it's going to take a little while to realize that there's trust and you can experiment and all these things. Yeah, and I think a lot of that bridge is, is crossed if your leadership team and or your managers, I would say, to be a bit rude, understand what servant leadership is and, and how you start to, to help your team rather than direct them. So you change your position from a, a a manager to a leader and start really build up these guys to deliver on what they actually are capable of in our organization. And if we, if we think back to that uh, organizational pyramid we had early and we talked about what the layers were and we talked about management layers and multiple management layers, I think um, when we look to work that um, Holacracy, uh, so reinventing organizations and Humanocracy have done and the kind of case stories they have, uh, in their books for various organizations that have done this sort of thing in order to flatten that hierarchy the easiest quickest and most sensible way to do it is actually to remove management layers mm -hmm. and it's quite scary for people i think to do that we've all been like in that headspace where we progress in our careers and we get management roles i don't think i've ever met a manager who enjoys their job though because you're basically just a spreadsheet monkey half the time right so it's really quite boring 
Um, but yes, there's the hope that you might get further up the pyramid. And I've worked with banks where they use terms like um, the frozen mid middle layer. So what they mean by that is kind of they're being told to do stuff up here. It's impossible to do these people know here. So the, the people in the middle are just like like a rabbit in the headlights. They can't do anything. There's like a total tension. So um, Soren's point leadership needs to change the whole purpose of leadership needs to change from being a manager to being a, a coach themselves that helps people and teams perform self-discovery um and help them remove impediments yep. soren we talked about this before as well because i'm of the opinion um that holacracy might be quite difficult to get going in a mass uh, way in the uk because of the way that we are um, educated as people to embrace power and status. And at its core, holacracy requires that a leader distributes authority and that leader should be the CEO. And we had a conversation about this and you talked about Denmark, where you're obviously from, um, being naturally more flatter in hierarchy. Tell us yeah. more about leaders, how they change, how they distribute authority and what it takes to make that change happen. Uh, yeah, so Denmark typically is a bit more flat than, than many other countries. Uh, we have a much more promotion here by, but a much more open culture to challenge and, and questioning things and, and spreading out responsibilities. Um, as a leader, it can be, and, and at least uh, as my time as a manager or leader, it can be really hard to do anyway, because you are being as a manager held towards the result you create through your people. And, and having the trust or, or faith in your people is, is something you have to work with yourself with and, uh, and build that kind of understanding uh, in, in, your, in your work way. And in terms of holacracy and, and creating entire flat structures, I think we'll be challenged for quite some years still uh, for the reason that all organizational theory taught around many universities is still based on the same principles of the generic value chain and, and how supporting functions support delivering value and so on. And that, that's the point where you have to, to push a bit if you want to change that behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and finally, of course, companies are bound by legal rules and, and setups where they actually have to deliver certain things and, and managers do have responsibilities that have quite severe legal implications if they don't uh, make sure everything is okay. So I think a lot of responsibility can be pushed out for now and, and we'll see that change a lot, uh, especially with the opening up of IT being more accessible in, in many organizations and the whole digitization. But a bit will still remain and, and be a challenge per se. But the question is how they get to a point where they enable as we do on the lower level layers. Let's have a look then at some ways to visualise what we think these new organisational models that perhaps universities could be um, thinking about a bit more might look like. So um, what we've got here is we've got a couple of layers of management. So we've got someone right at the top setting some direction because we still need that, right? We still need someone to say this is our organisational purpose and this is the, the vision we should be working towards. And then we need uh our leaders as coaches and then we've got potentially our value streams like this now we've got a question from the audience which i've been waiting to ask because i thought it would be nice to ask it on this slide which is from philippe clerk which is should we break the vertical silos or build horizontal pipelines through the silos jeff what's your <laughs> opinion on that as well i i think I think reimagining the silos as value streams from the customer's perspective, from the product or value that's being delivered as the customer sees it. And that's what you want. That's what we're showing here. And, you know, and you need to be able to see what's going on and be able to address um, uh, how you're reacting to the corporate all overall initiative and, and be able to provide how you fit into that organization so you can report back and say here's here's our component of value we're delivering um in that overall objective so i would say cut across that and it, like we're showing here is the right answer soren your thoughts <clears throat> uh absolutely agree uh, i think one key thing though to to understand is that uh, when you switch to this kind of setup the entire organization becomes your customers so 
you have to have a mentality where you sell your your service in a market space or you at least make it transparent what you're doing and, and what value others can get from it mm-hmm. but you also take time to, to consult these customers as you know uh, you can as an engineer easily get entrenched in your own idea and, and what you think the customer would want and there you have to be focused on that you actually get the customer needs from your organization and that's a big change in, in many organizations because in the past PMOs and other parts of the organization have piped that in to your values creation process but now you have to have that external focus in your own organization as well and that's that's a big change mm-hmm. so let's talk of some of the more of the practicality about getting here and again we've got a really great question from the audience from Ganesh which is is this horizontal pipeline not a silo in itself and that so my exactly- answer to that would be it's a silo in that it is a separate product or service to the other value streams. But what we've got is a flow of work now from the light bulb, which represents the idea to the value, which is the, the hands. So we haven't got any handoffs now between silos to get from one end to the other. Um, we have one of the questions that we'd prepared for the panel was related to this, which was, what do we do if we've got a central um, release function? So a release team that uh, may be coordinating a release calendar, perhaps actually even performing the releases, the release activity themselves. And to me, these are kind of related. And there's in our world that we live in, life is complex and we can't switch one organizational design off one day and switch the other one on the next day. There's gonna be time, uh, effort, pain, steps forward steps backwards as we go through this process so jeff to you your thoughts do you agree with me that these are separate silo are not silos in the same way are there any tactics for helping these value streams collaborate together when they need to and how do we manage things like centralized functions around release um great questions i they're they're not silos in per se that but have to recognize that there are subsystems of the overall just as much as you know if if i were building a car the the people working on the doors know that there's going to be an engine put in the car but maybe they don't necessarily care about the different valves or how the fuel comes in but they just know that it does and there's intersection points where they know that it all has to come together we all fit in the same category again to a a commerce application maybe there's a team that is handling the um, you know, shopping cart, another one handling payments, another one handling um, uh, promotions, and and all these teams can come together. Are they siloed? Well, we know that they come together, but maybe I don't have to know all the details of individual teams, but I can know how I can intersect. Understanding the interface points are pretty key. Visibility is the principal need to understand what is going on and where. Oftentimes a a release management kind of team owns the uh, last mile and and really they transform to being a coach to to help govern the risk and so forth uh, as a resource to each of the teams as they deliver. Um, They'll offer some oversight and and perspective, um, uh, you know, feedback on individual pipelines. That's actually helpful, just like a design is helpful to make sure that teams don't do stuff where, as you said, Soren, very lightly, there's significant legal implications or, um, you know, nobody wants to be responsible for for blowing things up and, and having that as a safety net can help if they can be organized to collaborate in the right way. And uh, what we're seeing in the industry, you know, having having Plator come from the background of traditional release management, that's where we got to start. We're seeing this transformation happen now where these release management organizations are morphing. They're, they're defining a bunch of uh, release trains and, and allowing individual teams to get on whatever they want. And they're providing uh, guidance on what kind of criteria to help them through architecture reviews and, and making sure that the right security things are, are, are in there, which enables individual responsibility, but you know, a corporate oversight, if you will, of, of the key requirements. Yeah, and if I may add to the silo part, I think the way we are used to discussing silos is that it is uh, departments of, of specialized skills that are siloed, and they can be really hard to to work between or, or across. And secondly, we are mainly handing off half-finished work products, right? 
Mm -hmm. Somebody writes the requirements, you hand off the requirements to a department who have to translate what the requirements were that came from a customer somewhere. And then you have to engineer, engineer this piece and so on. Uh, and now we are actually breaking down the silos by combining people into creating end products that are consumable when they're done. They're not just half done or, or less than that. And that's a big change because now you have to, to provide the full thing, although you're a group with a very specific purpose of serving some customers. But, but you're doing an end product. You're not just doing half a thing. And that also promotes that you take more responsibility as a, now we're picking on the requirements, right? But as a, a person deriving the requirements, you can't just push it down the value chain and say, okay, now it's not my problem anymore. Now it's somebody else's problem. And that's for me where we break the silos into something much more operable and sensible. I love that, Soren. That is the definition of a silo. Someone saying it's not my problem, it's somebody else's. As soon as you are in a value stream, everything's your problem. Everything's our problem. You might get extra help from outside, but it's still our problem. Exactly. What's the definition of done in a value stream? <laughs> Customer receive value, isn't it? I mean, it uh -huh. can't be anything else. And it's the same for everybody in the value stream. Exactly. So we've got a few questions coming th from the audience, which I don't think we should wait till the end. We've got one from Neelam here, which is, so are all teams, HR reporting structures, manager, employee relations, all up for reconsideration in a DevOps IT organization? So I'm going to start, if I may, with just some comments from um, the likes of reinventing organizations. So. Uh, those kind of teal organizations that kind of model that market leading model um, has truly autonomous teams that are doing things like choosing their own colleagues so they are their own hr they have their own budgeting so they um, decide how much budget they're going to have and how much they're going to spend and they run their own uh, team like a like a business like a pnl um, they their leaders as we've described are, are coaches so um I think, if I've understood correctly, all of those business functions come into the value stream as well during uh, a DevOps reorganization. And Jeff's nodding, so he can chip in next, and then we'll hear from Sora <laughs> and his view on this too. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I've seen it. I, I've lived it. Um, I, as crazy as it sounds, um, even in the old world prior to DevOps, Maybe it was a too big portion of it, but I still remember doing my every six months, we did a Bill G review with Bill Gates. And it was like, how are we doing with our business unit? And here's all the stuff we've got to do. And it was put all the pieces together because we were, you know, either either you have a hundred million dollar business or you don't. And, you know, how are you progressing? How are your features? What's your customer sat? What's it, you know, how are you integrating with other teams? That's ought to, it really is how it ought to feel. Soren, similar, different? Yeah, having been on the, the other end of the scale of that experience, <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, something has to be done about the HR parts and, and the surrounding parts so they become part of the value stream. Right now, they seem like they're an external force that are trying to define how you reward your employees, how you hire them, how you uprank them, and so on. And, and that is actually a challenge in, in a structure where you want to empower people and make them feel uh, well, not just make them feel, but make them appreciated in what they do and what their full capabilities are. But you tend to get, as a manager or leader, locked down in, in a framework that is quite rigid. Uh, and, and that is a challenge that has to go away, either by incorporating or, or getting rid of some of these layers in the organization. Rewards is one of my favorite topics actually around here, having worked with so many banks and banks are absolutely notorious for uh, chunky annual bonuses, which create an absolute toxic mess every year when some people get them and other people don't get them and they're, they're significant numbers. Um, so what I've worked with a number of banks looking at over recent years is things like peer reviewed micro bonus systems. So actually taking that whole conversation away from the manager. So it's not leadership now that are awarding some people for good work and being told that they have to give some people a, a poor review because they're only allowed to give two out of 10 of this level or whatever. Um, and they're micro bonuses. So it doesn't happen once a year. It happens all the time. So you can do something nice for me on a Tuesday and I can give you five pounds on a Wednesday and they build up over the year rather than having to wait for your leader to decide that you've played the right political games and uh, 
tick the right boxes and you get five thousand pounds at the end of the year so it's, and i've seen it in big banks as well and one of the best things i saw in one of the really big banks was um, we haven't really talked about this today, but we might get to it before we finish in the next 10 minutes, possibly not, but um, lots of the big banks outsource significant portions of their business. Of course they do. It could be data centers, IT ops, it could be um, COTS packages, but they'll have lots of uh, parts to their ecosystem. And what I saw in one of the banks was that they had their own micro bonus system and their SI partner had their own micro bonus system and they had integrated them. So they were able to give micro bonuses to each other, which tackles so many questions we get in DevOps about unifying these value streams when they're in multiple ecosystems. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we always kind of start thinking about the, the DevOps tool chain and how to get, you know, into someone's development environment if we don't own it. But actually just a micro bonus system is a really good example of breaking down those organizational boundaries. I think it's probably time we have a look at the next model, if that's okay, Jeff. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this looking at the clocks we've got a couple more questions that'd be nice to get to as well but uh, this is uh from basically it's kind of led by holacracy so it's a cellular organizational design which is a, a different way of looking at it um i think with the last one we were looking at there's still a little bit of hierarchy going on in there um the downside of this design is it doesn't really show us that flow of work but it does show us the nice um equitable working environment between different groups and also we've hardly put anything in there but you get you get the idea um sorry have you ever seen this used in an organization or can you imagine it working or can you see disadvantages on um using this as some kind of organizational chart i haven't seen it used in, in any organization yet but uh if, if if we're to fulfill the ambition of full autonomous teams then this would be the way to go uh yeah i don't know maybe just kind of add a bit i no i think it's i think we know where we, this is our goal we we got a ways to to go to get there and then um absolutely so hopefully in a year or two we can do another one of these and maybe do some case stories about where we've we've practiced this and seen it happen. Um, there are organisations out there, by the way, that are doing this already. Again, I've, I've given you a couple of books. Talking of which, let's go to the next slide, which uh, looking at the time, we're not going to spend uh, any significant time on today. I'm just going to do um, a quick shout out and promotion for the next Plutora webinar in November. I think it's the next one. It's certainly one coming up in November. Keep an eye out for it. Um, we're going to be talking about team topologies. So we're going to go down a layer of where we've been talking today. We've been talking about organizational design. We're going to talk about team design next time uh, with one of the authors of this book, Matthew Skelton. And I think Let's pass to Jeff to finish off with the messages uh, from Pator, and then we should have a few minutes just to tackle uh, the last couple of questions from Mafuza and Richard. Absolutely. So, why is Pator in this organizational design conversation? What in the world does that have to do with some cloud-based software vendor? The point is, is as soon as you push to more autonomous teams, you're going to wrestle with a key problem of visibility. You can't see what the crap is going on. Um, it, it, back in that Spotify model, I think the big management concern is, oh my gosh, if I give these guys, you know, free reign from a leadership perspective, I'll have no idea what they're doing. Well, in fact, that's the case. But many times uh, you already don't have any good idea of what's really going on from team to team or even across individual software pipelines. Value stream management is a new industry category. Of, of tools basically to sweep across the tool chains and give you visibility um, and governance across every bit of work from idea to production. The Platora platform does exactly that by um, offering a way to integrate with the tools that are down in that ecosystem and bring that data together, combining teams to make it all visible, showing you the value streams of where the data is flowing and then adding governance on top of it. Um, Key aspects of value stream management uh, solutions is to have a common data model, a way to normalize, if you will, standardize the data that is coming from the planning system to the CI to test to release um, and, and all aspects from idea to production. Once you do that, now you have visibility. Vis visibility creates efficiencies and collaboration. That's how you eliminate these silos. Once you've got it, you can um, add standard bits of uh, orchestration and management across it 
in a toolified or an automated manner so that it, it helps individual teams with what they need to do. Like I said, we started with the release manager where we now offer, in essence, a virtual release manager um, to every team. <clears throat> There's a template defined. They can go through the process. It can help with double checks to make sure the right bits are included in the pipeline, regardless of the level of automation, DevOps maturity, uh, agile process, or even waterfall. We don't care. That's the whole point. Um, and the best part about it, when you're when you're all done, all this is is flowed into our data lake and data warehouse, so you can get really rich analytics, um, live notification, um, comparative analytics and metrics. Um, you know, as as we move towards more autonomous and more automated ways of doing things, and we mature our DevOps journey, how do we actually prove that we're making progress with all the billions that have been spent in tooling? How do we show we're doing better and that it was worthwhile? Well, you you can't, you, you, as it said, you know, you might make improvements, but without measurement, you'll never be able to prove it to anybody that you're actually doing better. So that's what we do. Um, Cloud-based solution, pretty simple and straightforward. Um, with that, I guess we have four minutes. We can go to any final questions. Yeah, let's take Richard's first because it's very topical. Um, it, it is, is there some critical mass that is required for a value stream and how long lived do you see value streams being? And I'm going to give a quick answer before I pass it over to you guys, um, which was several years ago. One of the first value stream mapping exercises I ever did was with um, a part of a very large credit card organization. And what they were trying to do shortly post recession um, was basically separate out the backs payments, basically separate out the retail and investment banks because uh, that became the law after um, the whole global economy blew up, was to separate those things to try and avoid um, getting into a similar position again. And when we went and did that value stream map, they'd only done it once. It was effectively a project at that point. Um, and I've done value stream maps for many projects since. And, and to begin with, I'd get quite nervous when I walked in the room to do a project because I think, well, the whole point of the value stream is that it is long lived. The whole point is we're looking at the flow of improvements over time during that value stream. Um, but what I learned is that why people were asking us to do that is because they'd done a project and they were understanding that that project was becoming a product. So this company had done it for one bank and they now knew that they were going to have to do it for every bank they worked with. So they were going to have to create a service or product around that. So um, the, there is a critical mass. It's got to be something that either already exists as a long-lived product or is it going to be a significant um, long-lived product uh, that has business value um, in, in summary from me, I think. And then I'm going to pass to Jeff and let Soren, I think, have the last word today. So we've got two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn my time to Soren and give him the last couple of minutes. Okay. Well, value stream wise and, and that topic, I think you're absolutely right, Helen. Uh, it is the heart of any business. It is how they achieve their goals and, and realize value for customers. And, and it's non-trivial to keep it up to date and keep following. But you'll still see companies churning out the same product after 50 or, or 80 years, just more efficiently and, and, and more effectively. And I think uh, probably that people have to realize that IT products live for a very, very long time. You have a lot of things changing in your value streams that you have to manage and so on uh, as you go down the road. So you really have, have to keep that front and center in your company and support it in a good way. Otherwise, you're Absolutely. out of business. I'm going to steal the last word slightly and use one of the phrases that I say often in technology. It is a marriage, not a wedding. A lot of people get excited about releasing that thing out at the end of the project, but they're creating something that's going to be needed to be maintained for decades afterwards, I think. That gets forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. And, that. And, and any products that is like 80% of the effort comes after the first release, you only started at that point. Yeah. Anyway, I could go on for ages. We, we <laughs> could talk for hours and hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again at some point in the future. But it's been a really lovely chat today. Thank you so much, Soren, for your time. Thank you, Jeff. As always, it's been a pleasure. And mostly thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, let us know if you have any questions and uh, we've, this is recorded and people will get a copy of that afterwards. Thank you everybody and goodbye for now.